texting, email, Skyping, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, amen, all of, all of that. Blueberry. Blue, well, <laughs> 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 How dare you. <laughs> I heard the wicked one, the world has given you endless ways to communicate with one another, but I have given you a mouth to communicate with me. And Brian brought up this scripture last Saturday table when Jesus asked the blind men, um, what do you want me to do for you? And Jesus knew what they wanted, but that question was more about of what he wanted, and he just wanted to hear from them. He wanted them to speak it into the atmosphere, what they wanted Jesus to do. So that's what I got. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Angel. Um, I saw a little child sitting under a tree by a flowing stream, and Jesus came walking along. He was dressed all in white and just glowing. It was beautiful. And the child was holding a bouquet of purple flowers, and he stopped in front of her, and while she was holding the flower, he leaned down and kissed her on the forehead, and then he sat next. Praise the Lord. Stephanie. Hallelujah. I got a uh, really beautiful, like, ornate vase, vase, however you want to say it. And um, it, was, it was golden and just someone went to put flowers in it, and the flowers fell right through the bottom of it. And uh, I believe God was saying something like, you can appear you know, as beautiful as you want on the outside, but what's really going on on the inside? Are, are you serving your purpose? Are you holding those flowers up or are they just flowing right through you? And um, yeah, you're, you're missing the Lord. That's scriptural too, right? Where, uh, I don't know if it's Habakkuk or Haggai. I think it's Haggai where God, is, God is speaking to him and says, consider your ways. Put money, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but you put money in your pocket, but you got holes in them, the money's just falling out, right? That's just right right. Consider your ways. Hallelujah. Brian. And, and just to touch on that, um, uh, that vase is not holding the living water. Amen. The water is flowing right out of it. Okay? So we need to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about to scru scrutinize yourself. You know? <laughs> check to make sure you are in the faith, the true faith, because we're in the last days. And there was a falling away from the true faith. Um, I saw a vision, Pastor, actually, you were in it. Um, and I saw you going up a hill. And on your back was this huge load, like something you would put on a camel. You know, and you were sweating, you were just going up this hill. And, and then uh, he gave me, it, it could be something that maybe you have that God wants you to give to him because you are leadership. And leaders are called to carry, and they're carrying a heavy load. And sometimes going up that hill, the load gets heavy, and you need to release and then continue up the hill. Because just climbing the hill is hard enough, let alone to take on all the burdens of everybody else. Um, but the other thing is, I think it represents too, is the leaders of the church. And as we are going into these last days, um, the heaviness, true leaders, Call ones that are truly called to the pulpit to tr speak truth and, and, and not this watered down gospel. Um, but uh, for, you know, that they're carrying a load that they need to, there's going to be a release in so they can press on them. So, so praise the Lord. Sure, that wasn't me running up the hills back there, was it? Because I was sweating like a dog back there. Every time I ran outside, praise the Lord. John. Um, Psalm 25, 1 through 3. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those who be ashamed, who deal treacherously, 
without cause. Well, I try to tend to do things myself, but it doesn't work out, but I have to trust in the Lord right now in my walk. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I was kind of hearing something about, I first loved you, why won't you love me? I gave everything for you. Praise the Lord. Oh, Janet. Well, I, I just wanted to say that um, song, that last song, I don't know the name, In the Silence of Your Love, um, I Will Wait. Well, I just wanted to say that that's probably one of the most beautiful songs. I love that song. You just get lost in it. And um, I think what I heard in that song for me was it's not so much about words and what we portray, but, you know, in the silence, um, you know, when we can reflect on our innermost feelings and, and how we treat others, and it's just not about words and and. and I just think it's more about, you know, when you're just quietly thinking about how you really treat people. Um, that's what really what it's all about, and I just love that song. So. The last song. I want to know your heart. That's Jesus' heart. So we can serve others, right? Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, in the stillness, the quiet, the meditation one. Yeah, yes, amen. One. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lisa. Um, Psalm 23, 3. Yeah. Don't desire all the delicacies, for he might be trying to trick you. In Proverbs? What was that? Psalm? That's Proverbs. Oh, okay. Proverbs. Proverbs. Proverbs? Proverbs, I think. John. So uh, I saw a ship, and the Lord asked me, what do you see? I said, I saw a ship. And then he said, and it wasn't moving in the water. And then uh, he said, you need to open your heart. You know, you need to lift up the masses and open the masses so you can catch the wind. You know, open your hands, open your heart to me so that you can catch the wind, catch the spirit. Otherwise, you're just going to be stagnant. You float around, right? James calls it shipwreck, right? You just, no sail, you're just floating around the water, not knowing where you're going, what you're doing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Praise God. Let's go to the table. Sean.
was good. <laughs> so, um, so we talked about this last week, and I'm going to bring it up again. And it's in um, John chapter 11, and it's the story of uh, Nazareth. And we don't have to go through the whole story, but essentially Lazarus dies. And when Jesus comes, Mary's brother, um, Lazarus dies. And when Jesus comes, Mary says, quote, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he goes on, he goes on to say, the word says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, we talked about last week, Jesus wept. And it goes on that they go to the, the place where he was laid and they move the stone and Jesus groans again. So he groans, he weeps, and then he groans. Um, and back in Luke, Jesus tells a potential disciple to let the dead bury the dead. So when Jesus weeps here, he doesn't see Lazarus and says, oh my God, I can't believe Lazarus is gone. I'm so sad and cries because he's gone. That's not why Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps because Mary and the other people with her are with the king of the universe. They're with the creator of everything. They're with the Lord of Lords. They're with the Son of God. And their focus is on what he could have done, what he, what they think should have done. Their focus is on what Jesus could have done with his hands instead of knowing his heart and knowing exactly who he was. So when Jesus weeps, he's weeping because they don't really get it. There's, there's a level of unbelief there still for them. And he's walking right next to him. He's been with them for however long, I'm not sure, up until this point. But it makes me think of us, okay? So, I mean, Jesus weeps for the, for the lost. So before we came, come to Christ, Jesus might be, might be weeping for us. He's, he's pursuing us. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we have Jesus living inside of us, that's... That's where the groaning comes in. The groaning comes in when I say that I'm a true believer of Jesus Christ and then I go do things that don't exemplify what a true believer should do according to his word. Jesus doesn't weep when I do that. He groans. He's frustrated. That's the difference between the weeping and the frustration. So, I mean, I pray that every day that I don't do anything that's going to Make Jesus groan in his spirit. Amen. That would discount, you know, what he did on the cross. Jesus is walking side by side with these people. And we might think, man, they got to walk next to Jesus. But if, if Mary were here right now, she might say to us, you have Jesus living inside of you. You know, we might look to them and think, man, I wish... I could have been there with him. And she might say to us, though, man, I wish I could be here where you are with him inside of you. And when we don't live that way, he groans. He's frustrated, understandably so. So let's take a moment and bring anything to the cross that we know in our hearts probably caused Jesus to groan and ask for forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, he sat with his disciples. He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He said, this is my body, which has been beaten and broken for you. Take and eat. In the same manner, he raised the cup. 
and he said, this told his disciples, he blessed it, and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Take and drink. Amen. Do you know her name? Renee. Renee. Father, we lift up Renee, and we just rebuke that um, tumor in the name of Jesus. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus, and we speak healing to her in the name of Jesus, Father. Shrink that tumor up so that it no longer exists, Lord. Heal her, Lord, so that she knows that you are real. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Paul. Uh, Sue. Everybody, Everybody that you have, okay, that you yeah, pray, okay, all right, well, Father, we lift up Sue, and we just pray for her as well, and we pray for healing for her, we rebuke the cancer that it is in her brain, Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak healing to her, Father, that she would be healed whole and restored completely, and uh, Father, we can just pray for the people that um, Paul has the opportunity to, to meet and to pray for, Lord, we just pray that you would just answer those prayers, Lord, that, um, that they would trust you, that they would know that you are God because of those prayers that are answered for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Frank? Uh, uh, my brother-in-law, Bob, uh, my older sister, Kim's husband, he got a motorcycle accident. Mm. He lost his leg. They saved his finger. He punctured a lung, but he's got he said he needs skin grafts all over his body. He said he's in rough shape, so um, salvation Father, we lift up Bob, and we just um, we just bring him before you, and we ask, Lord, that you would use this accident, Lord, to um, give him a wake-up call, Lord. Let him know that he is fragile, he's human, and he will have an end one day. And Father, just pray that he would know you so that when his end comes, he would meet you. And Lord, I pray that as he deals with all the pain and everything that he's going to be going through, Lord, because of this accident, I just pray, Lord, that um, he would cry out to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet him there in that pain and heal him, Father. Heal him and restore him. And um, I just pray, Lord, that one day he will be glad and full of joy because of what he went through to meet you. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. JC? Father, we lift up Marissa and her family. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you put angels around them, and we pray for travel mercies, safe travels home. In Jesus' name, amen. Frank? Anybody talk the same language? Okay. You feel good? All right or good? Don't know? Okay. All right. Well, Father, we lift up Ivan, and we just pray, Lord, that he would be doing good, that he would be doing amazing and awesome, and um, that he is full of the Spirit, doing the things that you want him to do, Father. We just pray that you would strengthen him, give him the endurance, Father, to follow through on all the things that he learned here, Father. We just lift him up to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would watch over him and bless him abundantly beyond anything we can ask, think, or hope for. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we lift up Josh, and we just ask, Lord, that you would fill him up mightily with the Holy Spirit, that you would have him walk in in the things that you have laid out for him. Father, we just pray for um, just that you would break, bring to fruition those plans, Lord, that you have for him, Lord, that you would open up his eyes and bring those connections to him, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that um, just 
just that you would be blessed, Father. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you bring people alongside of him that would be able to help him bring this, fr fr bring this dream to fruition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For, and Father, everybody, for everybody that likes me, put your hand, put your hand <laughs> towards me so that I can get the weed and I'll pray. Yeah. All right. Father, I just lift up my husband, and I just pray, Lord, that you would strengthen him. Father, if there is an extra burden that he is carrying, Father, we just ask, Lord, that um, you'd give him wisdom to commit it to you, to give it all over to you, Lord. You ask us to cast our cares upon you, and we just pray that he would do just that. Father, give him strength, give him endurance, give him wisdom and knowledge, and everything that he does, everything he puts his hand, heart, and mind to, Father, give him the wisdom to know what he needs to do, Father. Give him the strength and the endurance to follow through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Father, we lift up Daniel, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that whatever's going on, we pray for healing. We pray, Lord, that um, if he um, needs some wisdom on what it is, Father, we just pray, Lord, for um, your perfect will to be done and that he would be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we just lift up Josephine, and we just pray for wisdom where her health is concerned as well, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that um, uh, she would be healed and whole and restored in Jesus' name. Amen. John? Uh, Wendy Gerard, she just got diagnosed with cancer, a friend of my mother's. And then uh, the Casorix, uh protection for Intogo. Uh, you just, you're talking in a different language. <laughs> Kosorix is okay. their last name. My cousins, <laughs> they're in Togo, Africa, and uh, Boko Haram is mm -hmm. on the border. Okay. So the people that are, are, are they Just missionary? protection for the country. They're yeah, they're, they're missionaries in Africa. Missionaries and in the, Africa. Yeah, the Islamic, the Islamic extremists are. Very dangerous place. Yeah. All right. Just protection. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Protection. <laughs> uh, Father, I just, I just want to lift up those missionaries, Lord. Um, and I don't mean to laugh because I know it's not funny, but Father, we just pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, that you put your protection around them. Father, we, we uh, just ask right now, release your angels to them. Surround and protect them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And keep them protected doing what they're doing, Lord, that they're bringing their word your word to these people, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would make a way for them to do that and keep them safe in doing that in Jesus' name. And Father, I want to pray for Wendy. I just lift her up to you, Lord, and I just pray for healing for her. We rebuke that cancer that's in her, Lord, and we ask right now for complete and total healing. All cancer gone in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we lift up John, and we just pray, Lord, that um, you would give him the strength and endurance, endurance to follow through on, on the commitment that he's made at Total Freedom in, in Florida. And we just ask, Lord, that um, you just be with him and bless him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Debbie. How's he doing? Your dad. Amen. All right. Father, we lift up Debbie's dad, and we just pray, Lord, that you would continue the healing and the mending, that... Uh, uh, he would be completely healed and whole in Jesus' name. And, Father, we just thank you uh, for Glenn being here safe and sound. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, you would continue to mend his heart, Lord, and um, just continue to uh, do a work in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Kevin? Is it Wednesday? All right. It was last week I was thinking that. Father, we just lift up Steph, and we just pray, Lord, for your favor to go before her in the courts. Father, we just ask, Lord, that your will would be done and that she would be allowed to do and complete what she has started here and uh, that uh, everything that um, could happen will not happen, and she'll have um, – everything will be thrown out, and she will have just a positive <coughs> outcome from this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Or Joy, I know.
Father, we pray for uh, Larry and Joe. We just ask, Lord, that you keep them safe and protect them wherever they may be, Father, and uh, just strengthen them in, in uh, what they're doing today, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, for Joe and Ella. We ask, Lord, that, uh, again, shrink that cancer, remove it from his body, Father. We want to see a complete and uh, just a complete healing and uh, uh, just restored completely that there would be no cancer left, Father. So that the next time that he goes to be checked, that there would be no cancer left in his pancreas. So, Father, we just ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Father, we just thank you for everybody that's here today, Lord. We just ask that you open our hearts and minds to receive. And we ask, Lord, that you would anoint John mightily to speak the words that you have placed in his heart to speak and bring all glory, honor, and praise to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Testimonies. Who's got to give God some glory today for the things that he's done in their life? Praise God. Maury. Hallelujah. I just want to give him glory for finally bringing the hot weather, the warm weather on. It appears like the weather's changed. I'll claim that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Rob. Hallelujah. I just uh, I want to give God all the glory for uh, Pastor John and Victoria giving me the opportunity to move in uh, sales and marketing for the t-shirt business. Um, I'm very, very grateful for that, and I'm very, very excited for that as well. And I'm very excited to see how God is going to move through me to advance the kingdom in that area. God be all the glory. Hallelujah. Sales, sales, sales. Oh. Oh. Praise God. Dustin. Hallelujah. Um, I just want to give God the glory for a bunch of things. Um, I mean, every all the time here we see just blessings and miracles and healing and restoration and people being set free. And uh, it's all through him. You know what I mean? Like, we don't do anything except for be obedient to him, but you got the healing of the glad and the miracle and blessings for JC and myself and freedom for Stephanie and healing for my grandfather. Um, it's just there's so many things that you could talk about it all day, but it's just to God be all the glory. Hallelujah. Glenn. said it was a heart attack, but I called it a third chance. I want to give God the glory for that. The second thing is, I want to give God all the glory for the work he's did in bed. Because if this would have happened probably a year and a half, two years ago, that would have been a mess. But during the whole thing in the hospital, Deb knew God had this. She was calm. She was relaxed. And I didn't see no worry on her, which made it a lot easier for me to accept what was going on. And the third and final is what God's doing with the business right now. He's giving us work upon work upon work. I mean, at least once a day I'm answering the phone for to go out on an estimate. And I want to give God all the glory for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Stephanie. Hallelujah. Uh, I would like to give God all the glory for... Uh, everything he has done in my life. Um, everything he's delivered me from, everything he's going to deliver me from, I, I am almost speechless, almost. That would be, that would be a miracle. <laughs> um, uh, most of you know I had, uh, del my deliverance was Thursday. Um, I, I just can't get over God's grace and uh, how many times I was in Satan's grip that he just pulled me right out of his hands, said, nope, not that one. You know, I got plans for her. So um, I can't be grateful enough for um, Josh finding this place. So then I finding that place through Josh. And um, God's love is um, powerful. Um, like that song, Fierce, like his relentless pursuit 
after each and every one of us is life changing and um, it's enough to bring like a guy who's six seven three fifty to you know a kindergarten teacher to everyone like to their knees because his love is so powerful and um, there's a couple of visions that God brings me back to um, and I see myself in third person and uh, I call it the pure version of myself because I've got like this golden glow and just there's a sparkle in my eye and um, I look in the mirror now and it's like those visions have come to fruition and become reality because I'm seeing the woman that God wants me to become and come to life and like every time I look in the mirror it's it's right there in front of me so it's it's almost like that song in glimmer and dust um, that's one of the visions that I always get it in but um, I see Jesus as I look in the mirror more and more each day. So I want to give God the glory for all of that because I am the complete opposite of my old woman. Um, and I can't be more <laughs> full of joy that I'm not who I used to be. So to God be all the glory. And thank you, Pastor Donna Victoria. Hallelujah. Lori. I just want to uh, say, I, I had this feeling at uh, my, our first church that we went to Evangel, and then here it was reiterated just that we can utter the name of Jesus because a lot of the world can't. But we can. We've got a Savior, and we know him, and he, he's got us. So I'm thankful that I can sing his name and say his name. Mm. How are you? Brian. I just, I just want to touch on what, what Stephanie, I like what she said, woman. Because, and then the scripture came to me when I was a child, I acted like a child, you know. But now that I became a man or a woman, done away with childish things, you know, so that's, that's growth and that's, that's awesome, because God's all in the growth, okay, yeah. we're supposed to grow, you know, and put away the childish things, so praise the Lord. Oh, um, I just want to give a testimony, I wasn't here last Sunday, but um, that, that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, um, uh, for Joshua Revolution, we had the banquet on Thursday, uh, it was Brian and, um, and Maury went to, and Joe. And, uh, which was awesome. And then on uh, Saturday, uh, we went to uh, Niagara Falls High School and did a rally. And uh, it was just totally awesome. And, and 25 kids and teachers got, gave their life to Christ that day. And then Saturday, we, we did a rally at uh, Cross River. And the um, pastor was disappointed because he sent flyers out to all the churches in the area. No one showed up, but there was, you know, probably 25 kids there or whatever, but 10 of them gave their life to Christ. And the altar, they were crying at the altar. It was just the most beautiful thing. And, and it doesn't matter how many get, it, if, it, if one soul gets Amen. saved, that's that's all. And I'm just grateful that uh, I'm a part of that. I'm grateful I'm a part of Core Freedom. And, you know, God is good. And he's, he's an awesome God, and, um, and he loves us. And... Um, we love him by doing what we are called to do. So Amen. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's awesome. John. Thank you. So uh, Monday, me, Glenn, and Debbie were at a job, and a lady had fibromyalgia and arthritis. And she was complaining about it to me and Glenn. And Glenn looks at me, and I start smiling. I just look at the lady, and I go, you want to be healed? And she was like, I love that. And I go, we're going to heal you right now. And so uh, she asked how much money it would be. I told her, <laughs> I told her, it doesn't cost money. Jesus freely gave it to us. We're going to freely give it. So me, Glenn, and Debbie laid hands on her, and she was healed instantly. Great. 
So, I mean, it was it was just awesome, you know. Uh, God build the glory. And then... <laughs> no, she, was, she, was, she just didn't know what to say, man. She was amazed. Praise God. But then uh, Wednesday, I, or not Wednesday, Tuesday I had surgery, and... Um, it was it was the first time I ever gone under, but then, uh, I mean Wednesday, that was it. You know that was uh, usually I've, I've had broken bones. I've had a lot of uh, injuries in the past, and I always depended on pain pills and stuff like that. And you know that was that was who I thought I was, and I just sucked it up. And God be all the glory. It didn't it wasn't that painful? You know, just you know it was awesome. I mean that's just that's proof right there that God God power God. You know, Amen. so. Praise the Lord, you know. It doesn't seem like that much, but, uh, I mean, <laughs> the old me wouldn't be here right now mm -hmm. if I had gotten a script. Let's put it that way. So praise the Lord, you know. It's the, the power of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. David. Thursday morning, I got a text that my son was in the ER at Highland Hospital and wasn't sure what was going on, um, but he had a couple different symptoms were pressure on the spinal cord and pressure on his brain. He was in severe pain, as you can imagine, if your brain is swollen. Um, still, I didn't know. I tried to call him the hospital and through other people, there was no diagnosis, and I didn't want to keep ringing the phone, knowing that someone was in such pain with the ringing of a phone. It would just add to that. But um, there was no panic. I just trusted God. I reached out to brothers, sisters, just asked them to pray, which they did. And um, he was admitted Thursday night. And Friday morning, I tried getting a hold of him, and I couldn't. And then I found out. Friday afternoon that he was released Friday morning with no diagnosis and uh, there was no never any fear there was never any panic I put it in God's hand trusted in him completely and Glenn mentioned something or saw him yesterday when I was out with Doug and he mentioned yesterday with his what he went through that God used this for a reason and that was my prayer, that God would, not that I, I pray that someone goes through pain and suffering, but God uses that at times to bring us to where he wants us to be, to realize, you know, how precious this life really is and that we only get one chance to serve him. And, but the bottom line is the trusting. And, you know, today's modern age with, medical science and everything, you know, they can do all kinds of, but God's miracles just never cease. And Dustin touched on it earlier. You can go on and on and on with the things that God does. But when we call out and ask him, that's when he's not weeping. That's when he goes to work because he knows our hearts. And I just want to give him all the glory for that. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Testimonies? Uh, in worship, I... Uh, you want me to bring the mic over there? Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, but let me bring the mic over there. <laughs> Praise God. Testimony. Hallelujah. When in worship, um, I, I, I asked I says, I ask him, I says, where are you? Inside. He says, and I heard this word, uh, not audible, but inside, it says, um, he says, I'm here, stay here. And so so I'm sensing his presence. Awesome, Richard. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Testimony. Kevin. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Doug said I'm gonna get a rash today. <laughs> False prophet. <laughs> Praise God. 
No, our, our, uh, I was at a council meeting and our youth pastor shared just a piggyback on Brian and uh, the youth convention. Uh, we had, uh, he shared that there was a Jewish girl that was coming to youth group and um, she really couldn't afford to go to youth convention so I guess they ended up paying for her and getting her there. Well, the second night she got saved, radically saved. And um, the same night, and this is totally how God works, her mother called her, and her mother just started opening up to the daughter and just saying, you know, for some reason I just had this feeling that I really need to look into Jesus and, and seek him and find out who he really is because I really, I know of him, but I really don't know him. And that was in the same night her daughter got saved. So it's, it's got, God is very efficient at reaching people. And, you know, it was a two-for-one deal. So, praise God, she's on her way, too. Praise God. Anybody else? Uh, Paul. We're on a roll. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Um, last Sunday, um, I got Larry, Brother Larry, to get out of his room and uh, come to uh, my church back in the east side of Buffalo, where I got saved. And... Uh, I mean, God is, we put God in a box. A lot of us do put God in a box, but how, when you just let go of everything and how he can work through you um, with having willing vessels, what I pray for every day is just to be a vessel for him you know, to bring people to the light and bring people to the truth. So uh, I went back there, like I said, with Larry, and we went for my service, and I sat there and I just see how God has been working in my life the whole time and I, how I fought him for so many years. Um, about salvation, about about just just everything, and uh, you know when I remember when I got baptized there, and uh, when I got baptized with Taylor, how God takes people out of your life that shouldn't be there, and brings people in your life that should be there, and I, I met a bunch of brothers and sisters there, and uh, Taylor, and then when I got baptized, how God lined it all together, where I met Brian and Christine, and found out about total freedom. So when I was in a lot of bondage and a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, when I when I finally cried out to the Lord, how He finally, you know, not finally, but He lined it all up for me to get here, and uh, this has been the best year of my life, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. So uh, I, I, after service, um, we got up and Larry's like, "Come on, man, we gotta get going. We gotta get out of here. Don't be playing around, man. Let's go." I was like, "Well, I want to fellowship for a couple minutes." So Larry went out to the car. And uh, I talked to a couple of brothers and sisters real quick about, you know, how God's moving through total freedom and uh, just, just how everything has been great. And uh, a lot of them who haven't seen me in six months or so or more, it's like, you're just so calm. You just have this peace about you. And I was like, well, it's God. It's like, it's nothing I have done to trust me because, you know, before I was saving everything like that, I was just a total wreck. But, uh like I said, I wanted to give God all the glory for like what he's doing to everyone here and you know anybody that's still in the process now, because it's a total process until we get to heaven and it's going to be a lifelong process. It's a lifelong sentence, but people that have come here, see it through. Don't leave. Don't, you know, well, this, this, this. God's got it under control. Just see it through. Trust the process. And God, God is just awesome. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So he didn't leave. He stayed. He waited for you? He waited for us. I thought he took off. Doug. Longer walk now because of this. So, uh, um, <laughs> I'm talking to walking up there. Um, Kevin just standing up with the, the shirt there. I just thought I'd look real quick. I remember last week talking about the the thing for that ponchos pack stuff and uh, just looked it up and uh, 9,300 kids are going to get backpacks. Um, and it's it's backpacks. They got $93,000 that were raised. And so there's 9,300 kids that are getting backpacks with uh, over 200,000 pencils. So the teacher's desk got really blessed. Anybody else? 
You got one? Praise God. Janet. So I just um, wanted to share that the last month or two I've been able to go with Miss Sarah for her dress fitting. And I'm pretty sure there's a wedding around the corner. <laughs> yeah, and I'm pretty sure she's marrying Sean. <laughs> and I, anyway, I just, I'm so excited for her. <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very, um, I'm just really happy, excited for uh, Sean and Sarah. Um, love Sean, obviously, more than life itself, and Terry. And now I have a little family because I have Sarah, who I love dearly, too. Um, sitting next to them in this row and in this church at this fellowship, very blessed. And I, I thank God for everything. Hallelujah. I was going to say something about those sneakers, but I'll leave it alone. <laughs> God. I know he'll come back at me with one, so. See? <laughs> so Pastor Guy gave me a pair like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Testimonies, anybody else? <laughs> yeah, amen. I got one. I got, I get, um, I got a testimony for Abigail. I'd um, like to lift up my wife, Victoria, for being my Abigail. I never said, I didn't say this last week, but I mean, she, she keeps me on the straight and narrow path when I feel like I need to go kill somebody. But, um, and, uh, that's, you know, and that's what happened with David, right? And Abigail stopped him on the path. And, um, and it, not to that extreme, mind you, but, you know, it's, I'm just blessed to have a wife like her that uh, is a woman of God. And, um, you know, to be equally yoked is so vital, praise God, to, to stay strong, right? for each one of us, so to God be the glory. Amen. And, um, anybody else? <laughs> Testimonies, anybody? All right, let's get in the word. Tell me now, Dusty. <laughs> Praise God. I will get even with you. <laughs> hey, hey, man. <laughs> What's that? No, I'm good. I have a little more water. Am I the only one that gets that? <laughs> Praise God. This might be a little echoey. I don't know. Praise God. That's better. That's better. All right, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Lord, your word was with you before time. Your word became flesh, and now your word is given to us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it speaks to us. So, Father, I, add, Lord, I ask, Lord, that your word would touch the hearts of each one of us here today, Father. Lord, show us something that we could hear with our ears. To those that have ears to hear, let them hear, Jesus said. So, Father, I ask that your word would be spoken to each one of us in some way, shape, or form that it hasn't been before. Lord, touch us, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, um... You know, we had a, an awesome deliverance healing session this, this week, and me and Victoria have been doing it for 15 years. Healings and deliverances in Canada and here and all over the place, under the sun, praise God. The one thing that takes place in every single deliverance we do is that that person is delivered, and that person is set free, right? God makes sure of that because we were talking about how big God is. So if the purpose is to come and to receive in faith, we come to receive in faith and we're delivered and we're healed. Amen. Amen. And it takes place every single time. There isn't one single time 
And I learned this years ago, way in the beginning. I don't know if it was Pigs in the Power or one of those deliverance ministers I, I touched on some of the teaching and understanding was, I think it was Anna Mendez too, where she said, you know, when somebody asked her the question, does somebody get delivered every time you deliver? deliver? She said, yes. They're coming in faith, in my faith, God meets us there and people are getting delivered and set free. So we have to understand that. But demons leave, spirits leave, everything takes place, it's done, it's finished, it's done. But then here we are, we're standing here, right? We're still here. Spirits leave, but we're still here. And um, it came to my mind, you know, in conversations over time, I mean, but it just came to me stronger, you know, today in prayer. So I thought I needed to, needed to talk about it a little bit. And you've heard me say this many times because you see people have come through here. They've gone through the process and they fall. And it's like, well, they didn't get delivered. Well, yeah, they got delivered. Deliverance took place. It's just what happens after the fact, right? I mean, everybody gets a sheet that says maintaining your deliverance. And it has all these different things that we're, we should be doing in order to stay strong in the Lord to avoid those things from happening. That's why I say when the spirits leave and you're set free and that, and that it's taken place, you're still there. And you've heard me say it many times, you can't cast out self. We can't cast out self. What we have to do is we have to deal with self. Amen? And that's part of maintaining our deliverance is to deal with ourselves. And why am I saying it? Because, well, because a lot of things take place. I mean, geez, you know, over the years that when we've been doing this, I've seen people, I've seen a woman crawl, 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 crawl. The spirit in her had her climbing the wall like a spider, running around like, you know, flitting around like snakes, guy manifesting like a leprechaun wanted to kick me in the private area. Um, all kinds of crazy stuff we've dealt with over the years. But the bottom line is, nothing ever fazed me because I have the power of Jesus Christ, right? But... In saying that, when all these things take place and reflecting on some of those deliverances, some of those people had some really strong manifestations. It's kind of like the Israelites, you know, when God split the Red Sea, it's like, how could you ever go back to do anything else other than serve the Lord after he split the Red Sea for you? Well, how can you ever, you know, why is it that when you get deliverance and that manifestation was to that extreme that you could actually go back to do the things you did before? And that's because you can't cast out self. You can't cast out self. You have to deal with self. So in saying that, self, we all have different personalities, amen? Different DNA, different personalities. I am not like you, and you are not like me, and everybody is different with different DNA. That's how God created us, each unique in our own form. Every one of us is unique. In our own form. And God created us that way. For purpose. For purpose. Otherwise we'd be robots. All in one line. Doing the same thing. Acting the same way. Saying the same things. Same color. I mean all the different things. But you know what? He gave us DNA. He gave us personality. And personality is not. What we do have to deal with. When. When. Deliverance takes place when healing takes place, and we are we know we're set free. We don't want to squash our personality and who we are, right? Because that's the DNA that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. But what I'm going to talk about today is the things that we have to deal with that we can't use as excuses, okay? And, and it has to do with self. For example, somebody gets delivered and they're of uh, Italian descent 
or African American descent, and, and they're very emotional, and they like yelling and screaming, and it's like, well, these things that we do, we can't justify that by the culture you have come from. You understand? Because we're not in that culture anymore. We talked about it, I don't know how long ago, but we did a teaching on culture shock, right? There is no culture. There is no culture anymore. We're all the same in Jesus Christ, or we should be. So we all should be in the same place from that perspective. But we'll take those kind of things and use them as excuses, even our culture, where we came from. And a lot of these things that we take on are what I call habits. Habits. They're habits that are formed with self that is not necessarily demonic. It's things that we've taken on over time because of excuses of whether it be culture or whatever it is. We take on these habits and that you can't cast out. That's who you are. But that's not who you really are, but you have to learn who you really are. That's where maintaining deliverance takes place, to deal with our personality, but not really who I am because I like you the way you are. I like, I like Stephanie the way she is. I like John the way he is. I like Paul the way he is. <laughs> I'm kidding, Paul. <laughs> I'll get you back for Larry. He told me to do that. <laughs> because we're all unique in who we are. Amen? And, th and that's how he created us. But we have to deal with those things that we've taken on over time that, we, that I call habits. Habits that we've attached to ourselves that we need to let go. Praise God. I want to start in Titus chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. Now Paul is talking to Titus. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and detestable, disobedient disqualified for every good work. Praise God. So in the definition here, my pulpit commentary that I have that Pastor Wallen so generously gave me when, when I got ordained years ago, I was looking in there to read what this was all. They had a quote in there of what they said. They said they were, that they were professors of religion possessing its form but denying its power. So Basically, what was happening, and then it goes on to say here that their mind and their conscience were defiled. They had defiled minds. They were religious, like the gold vase somebody had it. They were religious and looked really good from the outside, but when you put the flowers in it, it fell through because there was no power that was there. There was no power at all. And the defiled mind... The final mind is what the stain, again, through the commentary, are stained with thoughts of impregnate, thoughts that are impregnated where activities are formed. So in other words, what that is saying is they became habits of how they would be. And they would justify it from the religion they knew because of what they grew up with of understanding, like people today. A lot of people come in here that they, know the, they think they know the Bible back and forth. Because they know it from here, which has defiled their minds because the actions that they're doing aren't true because they're here. It's like when I talk to the guys in jail, yeah, you're throwing scripture after scripture at me, and I look at you, and I'm not judging you, but you know what? Don't come at me with scripture. Listen, you're behind bars, so why are you behind bars? Not because of Jesus Christ, like Paul, I'm sure, because you did something wrong. And now there's a consequence for that. So now you have to understand what has taken place that puts you in that position. And that's what Paul is kind of bringing to the attention here about what's taking place is that we fall into these habits and these habits can end up being very destructive in our life. Praise God. I got a science definition, I think. So it's okay. I found it interesting because I thought, let me read it to you here. This book about mastering the habits of our everyday lives now 
now are polarizing this new science, helping us to think about our habits, where they come from and how to improve them. At the heart of habit is the brilliance of our creator. Amen. Making decisions takes time and energy. Habits keep us from having to make the same decisions over and over again. You with me? Habits, scientists say, emerge because the brain is constantly looking for ways to save effort. Left to its own devices, the brain will try to make almost any routine into a habit because habits allow our minds to ramp down more often. And when our minds ramp down related to our routine actions, they stand ready to engage with something new or more important. With a habit, the decision is already made and the bandwidth of our mind, so to speak, is free to us to focus on our energy and attention elsewhere. The real key to, ha to habits is decision making. Praise God. Now, mind you, there's good habits, there's bad habits. There's good, okay, so you don't have to sit there and make a decision every time you go to walk across the street and you look to your left and right to see if there's any cars coming so you don't get run over, right? That's a habit that you've gotten used to doing without having to make another decision every day to do the same thing, right? Those are good habits. But there's a lot of bad habits. And we get into these habits, and even in this program, we get into the, we get, we're trying to teach a lifestyle of healthy habits. Amen? But we can get into a If we allow our brain to sit in idleness, we don't use it to do something good, then we form habits that are, aren't good. Amen? And a lot of us that are in this program have made a lot of habits that aren't good. So in saying that, you can't cast that out because that's part of self. And you've become part of that and who you are with those habits that you've created over time. You understand? Yes. Praise God. And we all have that. There isn't any one of us that doesn't have to deal with something like that. Praise the Lord. The definition of habit is something, the definition of a habit is something that you do often and regularly. Sometimes without knowing that you're even doing it. So talking to Doug in the daily correction, counsel correction and direction, when we, have, when we talk with each other, some of you guys are doing things you don't even realize you're doing them, and you don't even know why somebody's upset at it, because you've gotten into a habit of doing these kind of things so much that it's become part of who you are. You haven't backed it up to make a decision to try to change that habit, to form something different. Praise God. The thing is, we have to understand that you can't cast out self, and that's what I'm talking about. You can't cast out self. And that's what we primarily have to deal with because of the habits that we form, that have been formed in our life before, before we came here, before we did a lot of things. And then when you get set free, there's like a utopia effect, a freedom, a cleansing of understanding. But you know, myself and my deliverance, you know, I got delivered, but there was still an area in my life I had to deal with that wasn't completely taken care of. Some of them old habits, some of it that I didn't, completely get healed and the root wasn't taken out, right? But in this area of what we do here, we're trying to take every piece of that so that you can be totally free, to deal with every aspect of it. And the whole thing about that this is a lifestyle change, not a program, is what I'm getting at because it ha this is teaching you to change some of the habits that we form over time. And that's why it's vital when you step into the next level after deliverance, you have to understand that that's a place where you have to be to understand who am I? Who am I? Okay, this stuff is behind me. The enemy can't put that on me anymore because I'm free. Right? But now i got to understand that I've had formed these habits that may not be good habits. So I have to really look at myself to see who I am and, why, and how I can change some of these things. Or maybe some of these things are still causing issues in my life that aren't necessarily demonic, but they're part of myself and, and I'm causing issues with it. Do you understand? Praise the Lord. 
So in saying that, we have these habits that we form. They're good habits and there's bad habits, but a lot of times there's a lot more bad habits than there are good habits. Try not eating carbs or sugar. You can say it's, we can say it's an addiction, but it's it, it's habit forming. So we, you know, we don't even have to. You don't even have to think about it. You walk by the front of a, you know an aisle in the grocery store; it's all right there, right behind you, right. So there doesn't have to be a decision made. The habit is to just go grab something and take it and eat it. We're beyond the decision making because the habits have been there for so long. We just take it and do it, right? Praise God. So how do we begin to transform the negative habitually formed ways in us? Praise God. Let's stay in Titus. Go to chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Paul is saying here, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. It's a lot of habit there. Praise God. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Praise God. So Paul, he's stating two different motives for the beginning of changing our stained, habitually formed life. Because that's what it is. We don't come to the Lord knowing that we're clean, right? Like Victoria's analogy, you don't, you don't, you don't get cleaned up to take a bath. Depends where you're at, I guess. <laughs> Car wash, you can hold it down first, then they cloth you, but praise the Lord. We all have stained, habitually formed lives, and that's where we kind of miss the boat sometimes when we when we get through the deliverance process because I've seen so many people come out of that and then they let their pride kick in and they let things happen and they get taken out of position because they think they have it all. They think they know it all. And through their old habits they that they haven't dealt with about cast can't cast out self, that's what ends up taking them out of position. And then soon enough other things start to attach because you can't be out there like a lone ranger thinking you've got it all. Praise God. Hallelujah. So two things that Paul looks at here, two motives. The first one is to remember where you came from. As he's talking about, for we ourselves were also once foolish and disobedient. I mean, to understand where you came from for what you're dealing with in your life. We have to be transparent to look in the mirror and say, this is me and this is how I am with my habits and what I do. This ain't a demon. This is me. And this is what I've done. This is my personality. And I do this and I shouldn't really be doing this because it's a habit that I form over time that's not positive. So I need to do something about getting rid of that. But that's where it all starts is understanding who we are, right? That's what Paul's trying to give us here. And then the second thing is we have to understand the love and the kindness of our Savior towards us. That he loves us. He saved us. And he can do anything for us. The song, Make Us One, right? A lot about what I talked about last Sunday, you know, about coming together as one and how you know, everybody's got 43,000 different denominations, so on and so forth. Why did a lot of that take place? Because of people's habits on how they know things. And they form these habits, and it ends up defiling the mind, like Paul says. It defiles your mind to not be open 
to real truth. Because they already think they got it all. But we know we never have it all until we're with the Lord. We have to really come to that understanding. Until we're with Jesus, we're still seeking. That's what makes life so interesting. Because if you have it all, it'd be pretty boring for the next, you know, how many years of your life. Right? You got it all. Praise God. What's there to get? We don't have it all. That's why he wants us to keep seeking. But we have to understand that that love and kindness comes from him, and he's pulled us out of all that stuff. He tore out all the roots that were negative. He took everything out of us. He healed us. There is no more demonic oppression. I'm set free, but now I have to deal with me. And that's where the book comes out with Pastor Wall and goes, who are you? It's a good book to read to understand who I am. And just touches and opens the door about the habits that we need to deal with in our life and kind of look at them, the positive and the negative, and how can we change them up if they need changing, amen? Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And he talks about, he says in verse five, he says, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The word renewing comes from a Greek word here, Anakinosis, anakinosis, A-N-A-K-A-I-N-O-S-I-S, anakinosis. And it means that it's a, a full, complete change for the better. A full, complete change for the better. And the Holy Spirit is the one that changes the habits. The Holy Spirit is there for you. What he's saying, it's renewing the anakinosis of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit in me that's changing me. It's changing me. It's changing my habits. Some habits, you know, when I got delivered, it was like swearing just went away. And I don't think, you know, that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to happen to anyone else. Man, like I said before many times, you know, being the hard cop, the bad cop in a union negotiation, because I was a union representative and I was in the union and I was the one here yelling and swearing and everything else. For that mouth to go away like that, and I didn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't even trying. It just, I realized that it was gone, and it wasn't just coming out of my mouth. God changed that habit pretty quickly. Or another one I can remember was horoscopes. I would read them every day in the paper at work, and then the day after, the, day, well, the next day I went to work after I got delivered. A few days after that, I'm going through the paper. I was like, oh, I'm missing something. Oh, the horoscopes. So I went back and I said, oh, I guess I don't want to read them anymore. So that was another habit that I was in that he just took away. But it was being in communion with the Holy Spirit to hear those things that you know you shouldn't be doing and not do them. Because even at that moment, it was still my choice to read the horoscope and put it away and say, nah, this is something I guess I shouldn't be doing. Or I could have swore because I want to look cool. I want to impress some, my, my buddies in the union, but no, it's not something I want to do because God said no. Well, no, he didn't even say no. He just did it. It's like I said, I didn't even, it just didn't dawn on me that the swearing was gone for a little while. It just never came out. But it started working on, on habits, and the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to guide us to deal with those habits that we need to deal with that are not positive. Praise the Lord. Let's go to Daniel real quick. Daniel chapter 6. Now, Daniel, he was blessed by God, right? Some of you know the story of Daniel. I hope you all know the story of Daniel. So. I have to tell it all. If you don't, go read chapter 6. Go read all Daniel and get the story if you don't understand some of it. But anyway, we're here with Daniel, and they can't. So let's for verse, verse 4 in chapter 6. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against <laughs> Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there 
any error or fault found in him. So Daniel, basically what they're trying to set him up because they didn't like, they're jealous, they're envious of him. God is blessing him. The favor is upon him. He's being used by the king and, and the rest of the governors are just jealous. They want to do something to nail him, to get him out of the way. But what they're saying here is they could find nothing against him. That he was incorruptible. He was sound. He was complete. All the bad habits that Daniel had, he got rid of them all. Even when you read in the beginning when he came in, he asked the guard in the jail, just give me vegetables and water. No starch, no carbs, no sugar, please. Just give me vegetables and water and watch how much, how much how we grow. And through that diet, he had favor because all, three, all four of them were strong in the Lord and strong in appearance, the Bible says, right? There was a lot of favor he had because he was getting rid of old habits, getting rid of the habits about who he was. And now, in saying that, there was one thing that they all came together. I don't want to read the whole thing. There was one thing that they all came together on that they knew about Daniel. And it wasn't because of his bad habits. It was because of his, his good habits. And that's he prayed every day. Three times a day. So they figured, you know what? Let's set, let's set up the king so that he, that we go to him and say, look, king, you know, a lot of things he's done, you know, they're, they're trying to butter him up basically. And here, Let's just worship you and nothing else and no other God for 30 days. And so he, the signet ring was there. It's done. It's signed. It's over. So in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. He didn't have to make a decision here. It was a habit. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, I better not go pray, or I better go pray or fight it. No, it was just, okay, well, take it easy, guys. No decision. It was a habit. It says right there at the end, it was his custom, a custom to do it every day, to get into the habit of praying every day so it doesn't have to be decisions to be made about it. About it. It's a habit that's formed by doing it every day. And they knew he was going to do it. But as the story goes on, I'm not going to go into all that part of it. The bottom line is God honored him. Not a lion touched him. God's favor was all upon him. Why? Because he dealt with himself. He dealt with himself. He brought upon him good, positive habits. The habits that God wants us to have. And that's part of what you're being taught here, whether you know it or not. It's a lifestyle change. As you hear me say it over and over. It's a lifestyle change. And some people, it takes a couple, two, three, four years to get the lifestyle changed because your habits are hard to break because you don't want to break them because you've already made the habits that you've made are so in, in, in defiled in your mind that it's still hard for you to break off of that, to make a decision, to make a new habit and to form that habit so it becomes a regular occurrence every day instead of what you were doing. Do you hear me? Hallelujah. So it's all about habits and not, it's not about casting out demons all the time. And the only way we can do that is by renewing our mind. Really renewing our mind. And to renew it with habits. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. See, years have gone by with Daniel in this. You know, and Time had gone by, and it was continual positive habit formings in, in his life that everybody even around him knew it. He didn't brag about it. He didn't have to go around saying hallelujah to everybody and be that gold base with a hole in it. I see those people every day. You can't fool God. You may think you can fool me or somebody else, but you're not fooling God. He can see right through you. First Corinthians chapter nine. 
Praise God. Verses 26 and 27. So Paul says here, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Hallelujah. So Paul's saying, listen, shadow boxing gets you nowhere, right? You shadow box, and most people, when they shadow box, if you're a boxer, you sit there and you look at yourself in the mirror. You know, you're doing your uppercuts, your crosses, your straight punch, whatever. You're looking at yourself. But you're not really combating with anything. And you're not really dealing with yourself. He's saying, listen, I'm, this isn't shadow boxing. I have to discipline myself. Daniel had discipline and everybody knew it because he was accustomed to it to pray every day. This is a habit that's formed so you don't have to make a decision every morning. Oh, I got to get up and pray. No, it's automatic. Remember what the definition of the habit is. It's formed and it's there so that your mind is already on something else. You're going to get into prayer to do your seven prayers seven times a day for, seven, for, seven, uh, for, the, for the week. And not like, oh, I got six more to go. Or no, I got two more to go. Or, I got eight more to go. Well, I can, do, I can do 30 of them in a day. If my mind and my habits are formed in a positive way, my, my mind and my thoughts about Christ and Him only. Am I working in my day? Memorizing scripture in my head. Bringing things into my head that are positive, not negative. But if you have these negative, and every one of you do when you come in here, you have a whole bunch of negative habits that you've formed over time. And I don't care who you are, where you came from, how much of the Bible you think you know. You still came here with this stuff. So face it, number one. Know that it's there. Humble yourself in the, in, in the presence of the Lord God and let him help you to get rid of the old habits and bring in the new. We need to make the decision. We need to form that new habit. So habitually, wake up every morning with the habit to, that I'm going to pray to God. I don't know when the last time I needed an alarm to wake me up, Victoria. She, she's my wife. She's with me every morning. But I'm up between 4 and 4.30 every morning. And I'm praying. And it's not what's in my thought process when I get up. I'm giving my cat a kiss. Patting them. But my mind, my thought process is that. But my habit is I'm going down to pray. Right? But I'm going to go into communion. I'm going to go into um, and, and confessing my sins, into communion, this whole, situ this whole thing I do before I sit down and pray. And then I'll get into the word. But those are habits I formed over years. So that in different times in my life, when I was working in different places, I had to readjust that. In St. Catharines, I had to drive every morning back to the States to go to work. So I readjusted everything. My prayers during my drive time. But that was habits I formed over time. Good habits. So that I didn't have to think about making those decisions all the time. Because if we get to the place of thinking and have making decisions, that habit's not there. You're going to be running into the old habits. And you're going to be doing them and not even like the definition says, not even realize you're doing them. I'm sure there's things that Doug can talk to you guys and counsel you with every day to talk about little habits that you have that, you know what, maybe sometimes you don't realize you have that habit still. And he has to say, well, why, do you, why are you still doing it? Because it's still a bad habit. That's why. And I need to change that. I need to understand how to change that so my lifestyle can be the way God wants it to be. And it takes discipline. Paul is saying, listen, you got shadow boxing, you're fighting. So it's taking discipline. Discipline and obedience, those two words go hand in hand. Daniel was disciplined and had obedience to do those things that he did. Those habits were formed, so it wasn't like he had to. It's because he wanted to, right? Praise the Lord. Get up and pray. Fellowship with brothers. How many times do we go running out to family that's non-believers? 
to the habits. Back to the old habits. Or friends that aren't believers. Back to the old habits. Eventually, it's going to be more than just an old habit. Something else starts to attack. You're forming new habits. So fellowship, iron sharpens iron. You strengthen each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Your brothers and sisters. Worshiping him, praising him, all different areas of our day, whether we're working or whether no matter what we're doing, we can be with him because he's with us everywhere we go. Like Lori said, just to utter the name Jesus. Utter the name Jesus, that means you have a relationship with him. That means he's anywhere you are. Even at places you're trying to hide to make sure he's not coming, he's there. He's there. We gotta let these kind of habits be formed so that be formed in us so that it becomes a lifestyle, so that our lifestyle becomes positive habits, so that we don't have to think about making decisions about it. It just happens on a daily basis from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed. Praise the Lord. Second Peter two nineteen. For those that haven't been here before, I only got a couple hours left. That's it? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, just two hours. That's all I could come up with. <laughs> Second Peter. I'm getting there. I think it's also Leviticus. Oh, it's in the New Testament. While they, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also is brought into bondage. Praise the Lord. What's Peter saying here? Do you have the, can you put the NLT version up to that, honey? They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For who you are a slave to, whatever you are a slave to, whatever controls you. Praise God. So in saying this, we can't blame again everything on spirits. It's habits that we form and we can't cast out self. We have to deal with self. And how do I deal with myself and the bad habits that I've formed? Otherwise, we do become a slave and stay a slave to them. Another quick story. I've said this before, I think. It's the elephant story about the circus, everybody? Remember me telling that? I figured Shaw would remember. <laughs> Anybody remember the elephant one? No. Brian, you did too? You shouldn't have raised your hand, Brian. So that's two of you. Right. Anybody else? I'm kidding, Brian. Well, anyway, I'm a, only two heard it before, but have you ever been to a circus and seen a giant elephant with a small rope wrapped around its ankle? I've never been to the circus, so I don't know, but I guess that's what it is, right? There's a, the elephants have just a rope tied around their ankle. Has anybody been to a circus? Have they actually seen that? Nobody? No. Well, how do we know it's true? Oh, no, nah, you saw it. Victoria, you saw it. Praise God. Somebody saw it. All right, so it's true. Did you ever stop to think, hey, wait a minute. Physically speaking, there's no way that that small little rope can hold back that giant elephant. Did you ever wonder how it happened that a giant elephant could be held in a place by something that does not have the power to contain him? Here's how it works. When trainers begin taming a baby elephant, they place a heavy chain around its ankle and stake the chain into the ground. Day after day, hour after hour, the baby elephant struggles to escape. But his efforts are in vain. He simply cannot break free from the grips of the powerful chain. Eventually, he surrenders. He resolves in his mind that there is no possible way he can escape that chain. So he relinquishes forever the struggles to be free. Then when he has given up trying, his masters replace that giant chain with a small little rope. If the elephant ever opened his eyes to the truth, he could break free at any moment. All it would take 
is one try. But since the elephant doesn't know that, he doesn't take a step in the right direction of freedom. And so it happens that 10, 20, 30 years later, the giant elephant remains held on in bondage by something that really has no power to control him, except the power he chooses to give it. Praise God. So see, we know that. But old habits can take us over and we can become a slave to them. And I've seen it with a lot of guys in this process over the years. You, it wasn't the spirits. You got deliverance. But the bottom line is, man, you haven't really cast out self. You can't cast out self. You have to deal with your habits that you formed that aren't good. And you don't want to deal with them. So if you don't deal with them, you keep running in them because you don't, you're not even thinking of making a decision to change it. You've so... Some ha sometimes you do the things you don't even know you're doing them until after you've done them. And when they're brought, it's brought to your attention, it's like, well, I'm sorry. But you know what? You have to, sorry's not good enough. You have to learn to change those habits in order for you to become more of who God wants you to be. And that just takes time and discipline over time. That's why it's nine months. That's why it's a year aftercare. That's why it's our rest of our life. We have to deal with habits because that's what keeps taking us down the wrong road. And we have to understand it's not about, it's a, a lot of it's spiritual and the healing takes place and it does, yes, but when we have that freedom and we feel it, we got to deal with our habits. The ones that we've taken on that aren't good. Throw them out and keep the good ones. And that's your personality and who you are. Make a decision to break the old habits, the negative habits, replacing them with positive, spirit-filled ones. You know, I can still remember sitting there with my, with Victoria, my brother and his wife, having dinner, and him and her are looking at us, and they're older than us, and I'm on fire, I'm zeal for the Lord, I'm on fire for God, and the first, the thing he says is, don't you think you're taking this too far? And it hurt my spirit. It's like, what do you mean taking it too far? How can I possibly take it too far? There's no way you could take it too far. There's always more. There is always more. But then I looked. If I spend a day or two there, the negative habits, one after another, were manifesting themselves. It's like, wow, okay, praise God. I'm not judging anyone, but man, you, these things, those aren't good habits. <laughs> those aren't positive things you're doing there. And I'm taking it too far. God wants us to take us as far as we can possibly take it. Titus, back to Titus chapter 2. I'm going to cancel dinner because I don't know if we're going to be done by 8 o'clock. Who needs food? Verse <laughs> chapter 2, verses 11 through, 11 through 15. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, which is self-control, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for me, for you, for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. The subtitle for this is Trained by Saving Grace. Trained by the love of Jesus. We have to train ourselves up to understand and move in good habits, the positive habits, the habits that Jesus gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he leads us through the fruits of the Holy Spirit. The good works, the good works he talks about here are the works of the Holy Spirit. They're person's exterior actions. They are my actions and what I do. My words can go on and on, but it's the actions that are going to really show what's happening. The gold vase is there. It looks really pretty. It looked good because of all the, what you're looking at. But as soon as you start doing something, the actions take place that just fell right through. 
Because there's no solid foundation. There's no rock. Verse 13, looking. What are we looking at? Distractions? Are we still looking at our bad habits? When you're going through this process, you know what your bad habits are. You're being taught what are positive and negative habits. It's up to you to want to get rid of those habits, to make the decision to say, listen, I'm changing that habit. So how can I change that habit into something good? Well, fill it with good things, the Bible says. Fill it with his word. Fill it with Jesus. Have more relationship with Jesus. Bring more Jesus into your life. Really living in life. Don't just say it, but do it. So that it's being shown to you. You can see it so that what? Other people can see it. He redeems us from every, not some, every, every, everything. He redeems us from everything. If you don't really believe, you don't really trust, if you don't have faith, then you're not going to believe that. But he takes everything. So he can take all my bad habits and fill me with good habits. So that I can be who he wants me to be. Because I have my own personality. Just like you have your own personality. But beyond the DNA and the personality come the habits. And those habits aren't demonic, but they're still who we are and they can become negative or positive. Ephesians 2. Last scripture on this page. No, this is it. This is the crescendo. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. It's not about you, praise God. Not of the works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created to Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Christ Jesus Christ is the root. Good works are the fruit. <laughs> Message Bible. Jesus Christ is the root. What was I saying? The Holy Spirit is the fruit. Praise God. The work. The works of the good works of the fruit. But it's true. The more we root in him, the more we're going to have less habits, negative habits. And it says to walk in them. To walk in them. I got a quote here, I don't remember who it was from, but he said, Motivations can fail, but habits can prevail. It's positive, right? Motivation is going to end, but habits will prevail because habits are formed by the decision that you made. The decision, the decision you made to bring Jesus into your heart, not just your brain, that brought you into a place of have relationship with him so that he can change the way we are. And that's the bottom line is it's all about change. He's the root. Good works are the fruit. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for your word. Lord, continue to grow us in understanding and who we are, Lord, to deal with our habits, Lord, that, that we need to deal with, Father God. Show them to us, reveal them to us, Lord, that, that we can transform them into good habits, Father God, so that we can have the lifestyle, live the lifestyle that you want us to live, Father. Today, tomorrow, the years to come, Lord. Teach us to number our days, Lord, that we can... Fall into those days the way you want us to, Father God, not the way we want to. 
Lord, I ask that you bless the rest of this evening, that the fellowship, that your love would saturate us in your fellowship, Lord. Lord, I speak travel mercies on those that are here that are going to be leaving later. Keep them safe, that they all get home safe and sound, Father God. And Lord, I thank you for the food that's been prepared for our body's nourishment, Lord. That we would enjoy the food, enjoy our fellowship, and that we can have a joyous time together today and tomorrow, Father. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, I believe we're having a Memorial Day thing for anyone that wants to come. You're invited. I don't know what time, Doug? Four? Four, four thirty. We're having barbecue ribs and family day, similar, whatever. Everybody's invited. Praise God. Hallelujah. God be the glory.